It took several years and some VPN shenanigans from Inhumane Bat to get me to play Bioshock Infinite, and man what an experience this game was. I have to admit that I didn't love the game on my first playthrough, but the ending of the story combined with the time that I've had to let my thoughts on the game marinate a bit have made me realize that this is probably one of the best single player games that I've played in recent years. It's not one of my top five games of all time for a small handful of reasons, but if someone were to ask me, I'd definitely recommend it to them. Bioshock Infinite is set in 1912 in the floating city of Columbia, shortly after the USA was out of their mainly genocidal phase, but a few years before they would inevitably join World War I. We play as Booker DeWitt, a private investigator from New York City who, after accruing a crippling amount of debt, is told to retrieve a young woman named Elizabeth from this floating city. If he returns with the girl, his debt will be wiped away. There's only a slight problem with this though, as Elizabeth is the foretold child of prophecy, Booker is identified as the extremely dangerous false shepherd, and the city is run by a man whose population considers to be God. After interacting with a magical possessed lighthouse and being forced into a baptism that may have very well been an attempt at murder, we find ourselves in the city of Columbia, where they're holding a town celebration. Of course, all good things have to come to an end, and the carnival comes to a screeching halt when Booker's secret heretical identity is discovered, even though Booker has no idea what on planet Earth is going on. Two police turn to kill Booker immediately, but with the help of quick thinking, he turns the face of one into ground beef before taking out the other one, and the combat begins. The combat is the majority of the gameplay here, and Bioshock does pretty well to keep it unique from other first-person shooter story-based adventure games like Uncharted or even the Metro series. Throughout the game, the player is introduced to a variety of weapons that they can choose to use and upgrade. From what I've seen around the internet, the holy grail of all weapons is the carbine, which has a decent fire rate for a semi-automatic rifle, good range, and it deals a fair amount of damage to enemies as well. What did my dumbass pick to pour all of my cash into? The shotgun. With what few first-person shooters that I've played so far, I tend to like to use the weapons that require little aim and can instantly take out an enemy. After all, it was far more entertaining to maneuver around enemies in Halo multiplayer with a shotgun than trying to make picks with a sniper or assault rifle. I mean, my friends sure hated me for it, but hey, what's a man to do? The shotgun is a fantastic weapon at the beginning of the game. It has 4 bullets in the chamber without upgrades and 20 in reserve, which means that if you land all of your shots correctly, you can clear your way through an entire zone of basic enemies, or at the very least 24 of them. However, as the game goes on, the enemies start to gain more health, and even with all the upgrades, it takes 2 shots to down even the more basic soldiers, let alone the mini bosses like the handymen and firemen. What's even worse is that the shotgun's biggest weakness is that you have to get up close and risk taking damage yourself at the advantage of being able to blitz an enemy's health bar down. It's not nearly as effective if you, well, can't do the blitzing, which kind of ruins the fun element that I associate with shotguns. In, in video games, that is. I, I don't use them in real life. I live in the part of Canada where anything stronger than a rubber band can be considered a deadly weapon. And yes, I know, I know, picking a different weapon to operate around for the game would have made my life easier, and I wouldn't have much to gripe about here. If you are to give me the freedom of choice, though, I expect my freedom of choice to be respected by allowing me as a player to pick whatever I want and have it all equally pan out. It's the same issue that I feel games like well, League of Legends suffer from, because in that game you're given over 130 champions to choose from, yet if you pick the ones that aren't adherent to the current state of the game, you're expected to do poorly more often. In the same way with Bioshock, I would love to stand by my decision to pick the shotgun, but I know that most people out there who have played this game multiple times over would say that picking literally any other weapon would have been better because of how often they drop, the damage, the ammo capacity, etc, etc. Reasons for which I know they're right, but how fun is this? in comparison to this. Let's put that personal preference aside though for the bigger picture here. Shotgun or no, the combat in this game feels awkward most of the time because of all the inputs involved. It feels like the game was released for console initially and then later ported to PC, which didn't happen because the console and PC versions were released on the same day. My goodness, this game is six years old already. At any rate, it feels like the game is much more optimized for use on a controller than it is for PC. The awkward grouping of controls is definitely something that can be modified on a keyboard, but with how the default controls played out, I couldn't help but think to myself, yeah, having that as a button on a controller would feel much better. 
I prefer Terraria on console over PC because the shortcut buttons for key items is much easier to work with than using 1 to 0 on my keyboard, and this game could have similarly benefited if I had a controller to play it with. F to interact with items, Z to aim down sights, what? Q to switch powers, E to switch weapons, right mouse button to use powers, and then your standard WASD and spacebar to jump, while left mouse button is to fire and R to reload. I understand that the close button grippy is meant to be there for ease of access, but I stumbled over it quite frequently towards the beginning of the game, especially because the main first person shooter that I play nowadays is Rainbow Six Siege and they have their ADS set to right mouse button like normal people. This is a minor thing which I can change myself because of the ability to customize your own keybinds. What I did find to be a problem was the fact that I had very little control over the sensitivity of the game, which is a big red flag for me when it comes to first person shooters. The whole idea is that I want to be able to line up my shots efficiently, which becomes vastly more difficult when the sensitivity makes my aim move around the screen like a broken speedometer. I tried setting it to the lowest setting possible, but apparently being at this far end of the sensitivity meter is code for I don't want to move my screen at all, so I ended up playing it on the second lowest sentence, which was still way too high for my liking. I figured that part of this may have been for console optimization, because I know that I like to play games on a higher sensitivity on console than I do on PC, but that still doesn't justify how awkward it was to play on PC, at least for the first few minutes. Now. I know that my keyboard and mouse have problems. Even if I've recently changed the batteries, they still freeze up on me from time to time, and it gets pretty irritating when I'm in the middle of a gunfight in R6 and I can't rotate for a better angle because my keyboard decided to take a vacation. However, I pretty consistently ran into an issue that I don't think was caused by my keyboard and mouse exclusively, because instead of being intermittent, it happened with great consistency. Every time I took a shot and hit an enemy with a shotgun, I wouldn't be able to move for a second, which may I remind you, I need to move out of the way of enemy fire so that I don't die. And you may be wondering, oh gee, you've been talking negatively about the combat in this game for the past five minutes, can't you just give it a rest by now? And I would, but the problem is that the combat is the entirety of the gameplay. Granted, the combat is fun in a few places because of how it incorporates these magic powers called vigors into it. How a normal human can take a sip of a drink and get magic powers, it makes no sense. Well, let's see what Anderson has to say. You always know what to say, Anderson. The powers that you gain help you significantly in combat, though I found that they trended towards utility when dealing with multiple weak targets. Again, like my shotgun, they weren't very helpful when dealing with larger enemies, but they got the job done when I needed to blast or shock enemies out of my way. There are 8 of these vigors in total in the base game, and I say that I got my fair use out of maybe 3 of them. Those were Possession, Bucking Bronco, and Shock Jockey. I liked Possession because it made it so that the Robo Shooties weren't so shooty at me, Bucking Bronco because it kind of helped with the shooting delay issue I was having, and Shock Jockey because it was great for trapping and stunning enemies. Thing is, if I ran out of assaults, which was more often than Twitter posts fake news, I would be set back to ground zero, and all the previous examples would rear their ugly heads once again to make this playthrough less than enjoyable. When I did have assaults though, the combat ran pretty seamlessly, as the control that the Vigors gave me would help me control the combat how I liked. I mentioned them before, but the many bosses in this game are pretty fantastic if I sit down and think about them. Without them, the combat would have been a complete waste of time and effort, because what's more fun? Fighting 20 of the exact same predictable police slash soldier type enemy, or fighting one big handy boy? When the game combines the use of vigors and the mini boss enemies, it made me have to think creatively in regards to my approach to combat, which are some qualities that I look for in a game. So, for example, Call of Duty may be a popular shooter series, but I found that those games relegated themselves to the status of just shoot things, and I was never really interested in them because of that. What Bioshock does with its combat is it makes you think in regards to its efficiency so that you can use what you have to dispatch your enemies in the most timely manner. Will you pick up the grenade launcher and command robots to rain fire down on your opponents, or will you instead rush in there like the Madland that you are and blow them all the kingdom come with a shotgun while they're knocked off of their feet? Let's be real, there's really only one option here. From what I can see, this game is rated very highly across the boards with ratings of at least 9 out of 10, while user submitted reviews are generally very positive about this game. A lot of people claim that this is the best game that they have ever played, but usually most of these reviews don't even acknowledge the combat as the main reason why they love this game. Sure, it's a bit more creative than other FPS games in its combat, but what it really sells this for most people is the story and the characters involved in it. Every character in this game is unique and iconic especially Elizabeth, who as a main character has a chance to make or break the game. What I mean by this is that I see most games with a heavy character and story focus are usually judged pretty heavily on how their main character is portrayed, because the player spends the most time with them. I mean, heck, most popular movies nowadays I'd say are judged by how well their characters are written, despite the setting or anything else that's been put into it. Elizabeth is... 
amazing as a character. And Bioshock follows up well to make her facial animations look at least somewhat convincing. Well, most of the time. She is a young woman torn between choosing her father and a man who she has never met before in her life. She starts off as the image of naivety, dreaming of one day flying away from it all and visiting Paris. But following the events that transpire around her, she becomes bitter, hearted, and determined in a rather convincing manner. Things she believed her whole life reveal themselves to be lies, and the things that she was warned of become her shot at salvation. And as such, she's perpetually at war with who she was and who she needs to become. I know that that description is very, very vague, and it is rightfully so because I don't want to spoil any of Bioshock's story for those of you who haven't tried the game yet. If her story wasn't convincing enough though, then her line delivery is. As someone who does voice recordings for videos like these and has dabbled a little bit into voice acting, I understand that it's actually pretty difficult to emulate emotion through one's voice, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that the actors are not in the same scenarios that the characters are. So Courtney Draper, who plays Elizabeth, isn't being actively rescued from a giant angel statue while a metallic bird from hell tears it to shreds while she's acting out her character. She probably recorded most of her lines in a recording booth somewhere. The same goes for most of the other characters, though I wasn't nearly as impressed with most of these other characters as I was with Elizabeth, aside from maybe the Songbird, a character that doesn't really have any lines of dialogue to begin with, and Lutesses. This is mostly because all the major characters that the player encounters, aside from those three, usually speak to the character over a surprisingly clear intercom system in loud intimidating voices, and it's not until the very end of their storyline that we get to meet them face to face. Some people may have my head for this, but I found Fitzroy's character to be the least interesting because of how her motivations were very linear and obvious. We do get to meet Fitzroy right at the beginning of her storyline, and then we never really physically see her again until the end. The argument could be made that this was the same thing that happened with Comstock, but Comstock was established at the very beginning as the villain, and has had the entirety of the game to influence the player. Plus, what the player learns about Comstock is vastly more interesting than what we learn about Fitzroy. With as little spoilers as possible, Fitzroy is like an intentionally violent and psychotic version of Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games, while Comstock's storyline involves interdimensional travel and is littered with war crimes. You tell me which one's more interesting. I emphasize being able to physically see a character as being an important factor in their development because of how a lot of characters' personality can be communicated through what they look like. In my opinion, the main reason why Darth Vader remains to be an iconic villain is due to his physical interaction with other characters and appearances throughout the original trilogy. If he were simply a voice that spoke over the intercom for the entire first movie until his fight with Obi-Wan Kenobi, he would have had a lot less impact. Same goes for the characters here. Fitzroy, Fink, and Slate, while they contribute to major parts of the story centered around some revealing and powerful scenery, are all relatively forgettable in my mind because they kind of appear, talk at Booker about their evil plans, and then show up one last time. Was it impactful though? Uh, sure. The fact that I remember the character's name well enough even a few weeks after I finished the game by now means that they had to have left some kind of impression on me. The writing for each of these characters is done incredibly well, as each one is after a goal that makes sense given the context of, well, their characters. Fitzroy is trying to overthrow the Founders, a group of white upper class supremacists that are basically the consulate and, well, founders of Columbia, especially Fink. Fink is one of the founders and is entirely focused on getting as many work hours out of a person as is physically possible with no regard for human values. The people that work under him are severely mistreated since Fink simply sees them as an ends to a means. Slate is another one of the founders, an old deranged soldier who's looking to restore his honor by having an honorable death at the hands of a worthy opponent. They all make sense. But damn was it tough to get interested in them when all they do for the majority of their story section is just yell at Booker. Granted, none of these characters that I've chosen to dwell on are exactly main characters, in the sense of how their involvement helps push the story along, but they're not tied to the bigger picture like Comstock or Elizabeth are. While I've also judged them a bit harshly as well, I think it's honestly quite amazing how the story makes the logical jumps to include characters in the same story that are so different from each other. The characters themselves aren't knocking my socks off in terms of their originality, but they are still colorful enough and gave me just enough of the story to the point where I cared about what I could learn from them. I mean, even Slate, who may be the most controversial character in the game because of his blatant racism, still offers some interesting insight into Comstock and Columbia's past because he was there from the beginning. The lack of physical presence of these characters does do one good thing, however. It allows the player to focus more on the setting instead of being distracted by a singular character. For being a single city, Columbia is both diverse in its setting while keeping a similar theme throughout. 
Most of the locations that the player visits will feature some form of marble construction or large statue. The roads are lined with cobblestone and the insides of most of the buildings that the player can enter have large sprawling ceilings. It was probably a style that was common for the time that Bioshock is set in, but I'm no architecture major so I can't really say for sure. Yet the diversity in appearance allowed for me to easily distinguish between different locations in Colombia. And when I finished the game, I realized that all of these places that I visited were th within the confines of a singular city, which is insane. Even games like Skyrim that have a heavy emphasis on exploration and setting don't put nearly as much character into a singular city aside from Whiterun, maybe. We know that we really can't escape Columbia because we're, oh, I don't know, levitating several thousand feet above the Earth's surface, so it's not really possible to go anywhere that doesn't involve a dirigible. I wish it didn't take me this long to make this video because Bioshock is really a great game all around. I was rather vague in my wording, but the characters and the overarching story are so engaging and interesting to pay attention to. The excellent character writing and fascinating setting helped me forget all about the monotony and minor frustrations that came with combat, though I wish that there was more to the gameplay because of how the combat sections felt like a way to further delay the story at times. And I would say more about the story, but this review is meant to be more for the people who don't know exactly what Bioshock Infinite is like, and was more of an open, honest commentary on how I felt about the game. I do highly recommend it though, and suggest you try it for yourself if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching, like the video if you liked it, and burn me at the stake if you didn't. Social links are in the description below if you want to stick around for more similar content. Well... I think we all know where this is going, so let's just skip to the end. That's all I have for you. Hope you all have a great day, night, or space cycle, depending on when and where you watch this video. And I will see you on the flip side. A goodbye.